I have already introduced the concept of phase locked and non phase locked activity. And what I'm going to do in this video is show you what our assumptions are about phase locked and non phase locked, how those activities manifest, or those features of the signal manifest. And that will lead to an operationalization of how to separate empirically the phase locked from the non phase locked components of the signal. Now, I introduced this concept of phase locked and non phase locked components of a signal way back in the beginning of this course. That was in the introduction section, and the title of the video, I believe, was Origin, Significance, and Interpretation of EEG. So, if you have no idea what you're looking at here, then you might want to go back and consult that video because I'm not going to spend a lot of time redefining it. I just want to very briefly remind you that the idea is that we call a signal phase locked if the exact timing and also the phase time series is the same on every trial and therefore it survives trial averaging. And we call a signal component non phase locked if the phase and or exact timing is variable on different trials. Sometimes in the literature, people call this evoked and induced, but I prefer the terms phase locked and non phase locked. I think that's a little bit closer to the assumptions we are making about the signal rather than um, any imposing any kind of uh, biological or physiological interpretation. This is another figure that I showed in that video towards the beginning of the course. And again, this is just to remind you that we consider phase locked activity to be survivable through uh, trial, so time domain trial averaging, so the event related potential. And if it's non phase locked or if it's partially phase locked, then it's not going to survive the time domain averaging, so it won't be present in the ERP, but you will be able to recover that activity, assuming it's it's you know has some rhythmicity, you will be able to recover it using time frequency analysis. All right, so with that as a brief reminder, here are our assumptions. We're going to get really, really deep into intense mathematical discussions here. So let's see. So we assume that the total signal, so what I call the total signal, that is all the signal. And we say that all of the signal is either phase locked or non phase locked. There's nothing else. Everything is phase locked or it's non phase locked. So therefore, we add these both together. And that gives us the total part of the signal. And we also assume that this is additive, we don't assume that there's uh, any kind of nonlinear interactions between phase locked and non phase locked. So once we make this definition here, then we can define the phase lock part of the signal. Here's where we get into like the really intense, you know, PhD level mathematics here. We define the phase locked part of the signal to be the total minus the non phase lock part. And we define the non phase lock part to be the total minus the phase lock part. Okay, so if you're a little bit disappointed at the lack of intense, rigorous, rigorous, advanced mathematics here, then I apologize, it was just a stupid joke. Anyway, these are assumptions. How do these assumptions get translated into data? What can we actually do with a data set to separate the phase lock from the non phase lock part of the signal? It's pretty easy. So we assume that the total signal is just the signal. So the signal that you already have is the total signal without doing anything to the signal other than, you know, cleaning, of course. So then how do we operationalize the phase locked part of the signal? Well, the phase locked part of the signal, we literally define as the event related potential, any features of the data that survive time domain trial averaging, that is the event related potential. And that is the phase locked part of the signal. So therefore, we define the non phase locked part of the signal as the entire signal minus the phase locked part of the signal. So that is the signal the single trial signals minus the ERP. So let me show you a couple figures. So you get a sense of what that looks like. So to compute the non phase locked part of the signal, you start by computing the ERP for one channel. And that you see here in blue, this is the ERP averaged over, I, I think this is from the sample data set. So this is averaged over 99 trials. And what you see here in green, or cyan, whatever this color is called, that is the total part of the signal. This is a single trial. This is just one trial that I picked at random. 
And it's considered the total signal because I haven't done anything. I haven't subtracted anything yet. And then what you see in the orange line is the same single trial data, but this is just the non-phase locked part of the signal. And the way that I've computed this orange line is literally taking the uh, total and subtracting off the ERP. So anything that they have in common is going to be removed, which includes all the non-phase locked part, or sorry, the, the phase locked part. And whatever is left, the residual, that is the non-phase lock component of the signal. And then you can apply your time frequency analysis to this orange line here, the non-phase lock part of the signal, and that will give you the time frequency power of the non-phase lock part of the signal. And then I'm just illustrating to you two different channels. So it's the same trial. This is one particular channel. This is a different channel. I don't remember uh, offhand which two channels these are, but that's okay. I just wanted to illustrate that uh, sometimes the when, so when the ERP is a bit larger magnitude, of course you're going to be removing more from the single trial data. In this case, this channel has a very small ERP, so we're not actually removing that much from the signal. You can see the total signal and the non-phase locked part of the signal look nearly identical. You know, there's like a little bit of a shift here, and really the only kind of appreciable difference is here. But even here, you see a lot of these like faster fluctuations are the same, and it's just kind of a little bit shifted up here because of this peak here. So separating out the ERP, uh, or the, the, the phase locked and the non-phase locked part of the signal is fairly simple to do. One thing you have to be mindful of is that this subtraction, so subtracting the ERP from the total signal, that has to be done not only separately for each channel, of course, but also separately for each experiment condition. So if you have an experiment with multiple different kinds of conditions, different experiment conditions, then you want to subtract, compute and subtract the ERP separately for each condition, for each single trial that comes from that condition. That's important to prevent any differences in the ERP from infecting the, from introducing artificial differences in the total uh, or sorry, the non-phase lock part of the signal. All right, so once you've done this, once you've separated out these different parts of the signal, you can make several time frequency plots that look like this. So these are all different time frequency plots that come from the same channel. What you see here is the total power, and the ERP is overlaid on top of it. Here you see the non-phase locked part of the power. And now this ERP is actually not the ERP of the non-phase locked power, because, or the non-phase locked component of the signal, because there is no ERP from the non-phase locked signal. It is by definition zero. And that's because we are subtracting, to compute the non-phase locked part of the signal, you have to subtract the ERP from each individual trial. So of course the trial average is not going to have an ERP. It's gonna have just a flat line. So this is still the phase locked ERP showing non, or plotted on top of non-phase locked power. And it's pretty interesting to compare these two plots. What you see is that this early power burst here is pretty much entirely phase locked. So you don't see it here. You remove the phase locked part of the signal and that part is gone. In contrast, this later multi-spectral component here, you know, these, this collection of red blobs over here, that survives almost perfectly. It looks a tiny bit different here versus here, I guess, but Qualitatively, it's certainly the same. So that tells you that these later features here are non-phase locked. They're of course present in the total power, but they are non-phase locked to the stimulus onset. Now, this is just for one particular channel and one particular kind of experiment. So you should not conclude here that the later stuff is always non-phase locked and the earlier stuff is always phase locked. That's just how it mapped out in this particular piece of data. Okay, so then to compute phase locked power, all you have to do is subtract this map from this map. Or actually, I said that backwards. So it's the, the total power minus non phase locked power. And then the idea is that all of the non phase locked stuff is consistent in these two plots. And what differs is the phase locked part of the signal, and that you see here. So this is the time frequency power of the phase locked part of the signal you can see that that matches pretty well with the ITPC. And of course, this is the ITPC of the total signal, not the non-phase locked part of the signal. 
just like with the ERP being a flat line here, the ITPC is basically all zero for the non-phase lock part of the signal. Okay, and what I've computed here is the time frequency power of the ERP itself. So it's just the time frequency power of this ERP. Now, the thing is, the time frequency power of the ERP is often difficult to interpret, and it's very difficult to normalize. It's difficult to baseline normalize because the power at most frequencies tends to be pretty flat in the pre-stimulus baseline, particularly when you have a ton of trials. So then the pre-stimulus period might be mostly entirely flat in the ERP. So in general, I don't really recommend computing time frequency power of the ERP because that doesn't really contain a lot of information. It doesn't really contain any information that you don't get just by looking at the ERP. So the more informative and interpretable way to estimate or to look at the phase locked power is here in panel C. So subtracting the non-phase locked power off of the total power. Okay, so I hope this makes sense. The last thing I would like to mention is that, in my opinion, making this hard distinction between phase-locked and non-phase-locked activity is a little bit artificial. I don't know if the brain really makes a distinction between phase-locked and non-phase-locked signal components. I think that is something that we as researchers impose on the data. So in general, I don't recommend separating the non-phase locked and the phase locked part of the signal unless you have a good reason to. Sometimes there are methodological reasons to do that. For example, if you want to look at uh, phase values early after a stimulus onset and you want to make sure that you're seeing some real endogenous phases and not something that's superimposed by the ERP, that could be one example of a motivation for computing the non-phase locked power. Otherwise, unless you have a very specific hypothesis-driven or methodologically-driven reason, I recommend just analyzing the total power. This is really all the signal that you get it from, or all the information that you're getting from the signal through this time frequency analysis.